All right, uh, act three, scene four, uh, AKA the closet scene. Uh, closets back then, meaning not a, a tiny room that you hang up coats in, uh, but rather someone's uh, private rooms, private chambers. In this case, uh, Queen Gertrude's, uh, uh, into which Hamlet barges uh, for their big, uh, their big fight, um, just as in act three, scene one, right? In, in the first scene of act three, we had uh, Hamlet and Ophelia's uh, big fight, their, their first, indeed, their first scene together. The, um, uh, the, the get thee to a nunnery fight, the, uh, as it's called, rejection of Ophelia. Um, the other uh, big fight we're waiting for uh, is, is Hamlet finally uh, having it out with, uh, with his mom. Um, and we get that in the last scene. Uh, of Act Three, the the closet scene. Um, now that would have been uh, uh, dramatic uh, enough, but uh, Shakespeare, knowing how to always knowing how to up the drama, um, uh, gives us something else right on the first page uh, of of Act Three, Scene Four. Something we were not uh, expecting. Uh, Hamlet quite suddenly finally kills someone, uh, and just Hamlet's luck, it's the wrong guy. Um, at the end of 3.3, uh, Hamlet, to the audience's great frustration, uh, decided, oh, great, I can't kill Claudius because he's praying. Um, uh, so uh, if I kill him while he's praying, he'll go to heaven. I, uh, I want him to go to hell, but now that his sins are freshly purged, I've got to wait for him to do something else bad again uh, before I kill him. Um, Hamlet uh, comes into his mom's room where Polonius is uh, hiding behind uh, the curtain. Any excuse with this guy to hide behind stuff and spy on people. Um, and uh, uh, the queen getting alarmed by Hamlet's uh, uh, attitude. Uh, what wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me. Help ho at line uh, 21. Uh, Polonius takes up the cry. Uh, what ho, help. Um, and Hamlet immediately... And I cannot stress this immediately enough here. I mean, this is um, a guy who, who more, has spent more than half of this very long uh, play, Shakespeare's longest play by a, a wide margin, um, is, spent more than half of this very long play not killing somebody for this reason and that reason and the other reason. The immediacy with which he hears a voice and just boom, uh, uh, b before we can even react. How now a rat dead for a ducat dead stabs Polonius uh, through the curtain. Uh, Polonius's uh, last line uh, at 24, oh, I am slain. Uh, the, <laughs> the first and only time uh, that Polonius gets right to the point in the whole play. Um, now, now, well, I, I suppose what we're supposed to think is that Hamlet thought it was the king, that Hamlet thought it was Claudius. He implies as much when the queen asks, uh, oh me, what hast thou done? Hamlet responds, nay, I know not. Is it the king? Uh, this, this would fit with the logic of his... his uh, what he decided at the end of, of 3.3, oh, I've got to wait until he does something uh, bad again, until he is uh, about some act that has no relish of salvation in then trip him that his heels may kick at heaven. Uh, Hamlet, what, hears the voice behind the curtain and goes, hiding behind curtains and spying on people counts as something bad. Boom, I stabbed him. Now, uh, the obvious question here is how seriously do we take this he thought it was Claudius? Uh, now, uh, the, the, the obvious objection might be um, Hamlet has known both of these people for his whole life. Uh, are we really to believe he can't tell their voices apart? Um, uh, you know, this uh, now, or, or maybe you know, since 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 we know, um, and and no play proves it better than this one. We know how much of. Uh, Sigmund Freud, 300 years later, is just, you know, essentially a commentary on or an exegesis of Shakespeare. Um, 
you know, it was Freud who first explicitly talked about this, you know, conscious and subconscious business. But uh, uh, Shakespeare probably knew it, even though he didn't uh, put it put a name to it. So we could look at this and and say something like, you know, with our knowledge today, um, uh, up here Hamlet uh, thought it was Claudius, but back here he knew it really wasn't. That's why he was able to do it, right? Subconsciously, he told himself, he logicked himself into believing that it was Claudius behind uh, the curtain. Subconsciously, he knew it really was just Polonius. Um, now, uh, this this idea of, of well, um, before that, there, there's yet another uh, joke uh, in here, a uh, complicated uh, joke about Hamlet's um, um, status as uh, a Renaissance nerd as, as an overeducated uh, uh, Wittenberg philosophy student whose uh, fancy education did not prepare him for this revenge mission. Um, uh, you know, it, it was observed by even contemporary critics uh, that um, though up to this point, you know, uh, Shakespeare had been thought of as, you know, a, a, a guy who sold tickets um, who, who, you know, pleased the, the masses, right? The king of, of, of you know, um, romantic uh, comedies and of, and of uh, you know, romantic stuff like, you know, Romeo and Juliet, I guess, was his biggest hit up to this point. Uh, a critic of the day even observed when Hamlet first came out that uh, his Romeo and Juliet uh, pleased the masses, but his Hamlet will please the wiser sort, uh, that this play was smarter uh, than anything uh, Shakespeare had done so far would, would please not uh, would not just sell tickets but would please uh, the critics and the, and the university crowd. So a possible in joke about education here for them. Um, now as any university nerd, uh, any well-educated person of, of the day, uh, you know what did they give you in school back then? They gave you ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Uh, up the wazoo, right? That, that was considered an education that was learning everything about ancient Greece and Rome. So um, Hamlet, uh, knowing a thing or two about ancient Rome, uh, uh, sees that there's someone behind the curtain and logically assumes it must be Claudius. Now, uh, for those who don't get that joke, uh, the the actual emperor Claudius uh, of of uh, ancient Rome, who becomes uh, emperor after the Praetorian Guard uh, bumps off uh, Caligula in uh, 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 Caligula's uncle. And uh, wait, my connection is unstable. Well, how how unstable is it? Is it stable now? Okay. Um, so yes, the Roman emperor Claudius uh, becomes emperor uh, when Caligula is assassinated. Uh, Claudius is Caligula's uncle. And uh, hearing the screams, knowing that, that uh, Caligula and his immediate family are being put to the sword by the Praetorian Guard, Claudius thinks that he is next, that they're going to kill the whole family. And according to the story, he hides behind a curtain. And the, the guards find him there. He thinks uh, he's about to get it. And to his surprise, they hand him the laurel wreath and, and uh, make him emperor. So this could be a joke about education here. Hamlet learned in school that Claudius is the guy who hides behind the curtain. And so seeing that some and hearing that someone is hiding behind the curtain goes, hey, I learned about this in school. It must be Claudius <laughs> and stabs through it. So, um, yeah, very deep pull uh, joke uh, here about about education and history. Well done, Shakespeare. Um, but e even even beyond that. Oh, and that this introduces uh, the question of, you know, to what extent um, are names significant uh, in this play? Um, uh, whether, whether uh, you know, Claudius, I mean, because in all previous versions of the story, um, Claudius's name is Feng or Fengon. Um, and now uh, uh, Hamlet's name was Amleth, so there it just gets anglicized. Same deal with uh, changing uh, uh, Gerutha to Gertrude. Um, but Claudius's name gets changed completely. Um, for some reason, 
uh, Shakespeare gives a, a medieval Danish king this ancient Roman uh, name. Now, to some extent, uh, it, Italian and Roman sounding names were just, I think, how Shakespeare signaled that something was foreign. Uh, you know, I mean, it, we, we've it, in the, the very first page of the play, um, we, we've got uh, g guys named Francisco and Bernardo uh, running around in the middle of Denmark uh, for some reason. Um, uh, I think that that you know, even in plays that are not set in in uh, Italy or Greece, Shakespeare still uses or for Greek names, you know, uh, Laertes, um, the, uh, still uses uh, Greek and, and Latin or Roman names. I think that might have just been how he signaled foreign, you know, to his audience, just as in American films today when they're set anywhere besides America, everybody's got a British accent, you know, even if it's supposed to be France or Russia or ancient Rome or outer space, <laughs> you know, everyone who's not Amer anyone who's anything besides American uh, in an American movie has a British accent. Uh, maybe for Shakespeare, there was a similar thing going on where uh, everybody who is anything besides English has uh, uh, Italian names. Um, uh, you know, we, we, there's a, a line jumping ahead for just a second to 4.7, where the messenger brings, uh, Claudius the letters that, that, uh, uh the, the first sailor had handed to Horatio, uh, and, and, and says that he had them of Claudio. Now, we've never heard about this Claudio uh, anywhere else, uh, but the, the messenger does say that he received, th that this Claudio received the letters of him that brought them. We saw in the previous scene that that was Horatio himself. So um, we might uh, intuit from this that Horatio's name was originally Claudio, um, you know, which, which would fit. Shakespeare often makes the, the friend, the sidekick, uh, uh, of, of the main guy, Claudio, as in, uh, say, much ado about nothing. Um, uh, so maybe Claudius was originally Feng, and then Shakespeare got the idea just for this joke, for the a guy hiding behind a curtain must be Claudius joke, and changed the names like just for the sake of this dumb joke. Um, and, and, you know, so made Feng into Claudius, and then went, wait, I can't have a Claudius and a Claudio. I'll give Claudio another name. Okay, call him Horatio. Went through and changed it and just didn't catch that one place where uh, Horatio's name is still Claudio in, in 4-7. Um, so uh, maybe. Anyway, um, if that joke is intentional, it's a good one. Uh, but uh, in, a, in a more serious and a more profound uh, uh, symbolic sense, this stabbing Polonius through the curtain, uh, I guess, can be taken to symbolize that, you know, we, we always, to some extent, have to act on insufficient information, right? We never know a hundred percent of the truth. You know, uh, we we're always doing the best we can. I think, you know, the plays, as, as mentioned earlier, the plays repeated references to outdated scientific theories, things that people believed in the middle ages when the play is set, but the audience would have known was not true by the Renaissance when, when Shakespeare's writing it and they're watching, um, you know, retrograde motion, spontaneous generation, uh, chameleons eating air, you know, th these references we've heard, you know, the truth is always the best we can do. Um, and does not having a hundred percent of the truth justify doing nothing, you know, eventually you've got to do something, even if you're acting based on incomplete information to some degree. Um, maybe that'll work out. Maybe it really will be Claudius behind the curtain. Um, you know, I mean, look, just look at the expression itself, behind the curtain. You know, uh, I mean, we use phrases like that uh, about, you know, grand mysteries, you know, God, God's existence or God's plan is, you know, uh, behind the veil, right? We talk about God drawing back the veil 
of, of reality to drawing back the veil of this world that separates this world from the next to reveal himself. This whole play is happening because a uh, traveler has returned from the undiscovered country, right? Because uh, uh, Ham Hamlet's dad's ghost has returned from uh, beyond the veil separating, uh, uh, beyond uh, the curtain separating this world from the next. Um, it, 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 this idea of, you know, what's on the other side of the curtain, is it Claudius or is it just Polonius? And, you know, uh, has echoed through, you know, many other sort of grand epic uh, 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 texts. I mean, uh, Ahab's strike through the mask in Moby Dick. I think Melville has Polonius behind the curtain in mind. Certainly, um, with with uh, in, in James Joyce's Ulysses in, in chapter three, Proteus, where uh, Stephen Dedalus is going on and on about the the, the ineluctable modality of the visible. Um, I, I think Joyce is is uh, who was straight up obsessed with Hamlet has this idea and, and what it uh, seems to symbolize um, a, a series of events and action larger than uh, its, its significance on uh, the page. Um, now uh, to uh, get unfancy for a second. Yes, obviously Hamlet could have uh, simply checked who was behind uh, the curtain. I mean, uh, nobody ever put this more pointedly or hilariously than uh, when they did Hamlet on The Simpsons and, and Bart as Hamlet exclaimed, someone's behind the curtain. It could be Claudius. Only one way to find out and stabs uh, through it without checking. Um, uh, revealing uh, Chief Wiggum as Polonius, who opines, I hide behind curtains because I have a fear of getting stabbed. Um, anyway, um, Gertrude is shocked uh, by what has uh, just happened or what a rash and bloody deed is this. Uh, Hamlet responds, a bloody deed almost as bad, good mother, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. Gertrude's response as kill a king in line 29. It's just four words, but uh, like everything with Gertrude, uh, oh gosh, how she says it matters. You know, uh, Gertrude doesn't get to, to talk a lot. The, the, the men in this play never shut up. Um, so a lot has to be done with tone and with facial expressions uh, with Gertrude, especially, and you know, I think this scene is the great example of it. Hamlet does 90 something percent of the talking uh, in this scene, even uh, you know, to the extent that it's one of the few places where even his biggest fans kind of wish that Hamlet would shut up uh, in this scene, uh, even if only because we want to hear more from uh, his mother, the queen, who he's not letting talk. So she responds to this uh, bloody deed almost as bad, good mother as kill a king and marry with his brother, with this as kill a king to which Hamlet says, I lady, twas my word. Now, how does she say that, right? Does she say it like, as kill a king? Like, you know, he knows, or does she just go as kill a king? Like, like she has no idea what he's talking about. Um, how she says it matters a lot. Um, anyway, at that point, uh, Hamlet uh, draws back the curtain um, and uh, reveals that, oops, uh, it was Polonius. Uh, he is uh, not terribly broken up about it, uh, shall we say? Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool, farewell. I took thee for thy better. Take thy fortune. Thou finds to be too busy is some danger. Uh, busy um, in the sense of uh, nosy, as in our expression, a busy body. So uh, he, this guy who has been so... Um, and had, had his stomach all in knots about the exact right way in which to kill the guy he's supposed to kill for the whole play so far, sees he's killed a totally different guy. And his immediate reaction is, oh, well, that's what you get for hiding behind curtains and spying on people. Like he just does not care. Um, now this, uh, this, this is, is shocking. Um, 
you know, we, we didn't think, you know, this, this Wittenberg philosophy student who's so concerned about what God wants would see that he killed an innocent guy and just be like, Psh, well, he was kind of a butthead anyway, and, and just immediately start yelling at his mom. Um, you know, so, so yes, as far as applying the word innocent to Polonius, that is the, well, one of the real questions here. Uh, all things considered, I guess Polonius was like one of the bad guys, um, but he wasn't evil. Uh, you know, Claudius uh, killed his own brother in his sleep and then uh, got with his brother's wife and went around smiling in everybody's face. That's evil. Polonius was, um, you know, way too into the business of his grown children and, you know, liked to hear himself talk and was, was kind of pompous. Um, all things considered, did he deserve to get curtain stabbed? Probably not. Um, so, so the, the, the meticulous philosophy student has turned into very suddenly the scourge of God here. Everybody who's even a little bit bad, boom, uh, stabby time. And that's what you get for being even a little bit bad. Uh, we might recall at this point that it was Polonius, the, the freshly late Polonius, uh, to whom Hamlet made that eloquent uh, little speech about treating people better than they deserve back in 2.2, when Polonius wants to show the actors to bad rooms and says, I'll use them after their dessert. And Hamlet says, odds bod can man much better uh, use every man after his dessert and who shall scape whipping. In other words, hey, give everybody what they deserve and we'll have to whip everybody all day long because deep down everybody's so terrible. Um, since we all want to be able to do things with our time other than whip everybody, um, use them after your own honor and dignity, the less they deserve, the more merit is in thy bounty. In other words, treat, give people better than they deserve, and God will reward you for doing so. Um, Hamlet has, has uh, you know, I think pretty inarguably just given Polonius worse than he deserves. Um you know, maybe a little light whipping would not not uh, have been out of order here, but probably not a curtain stabbing for Polonius. And he does not care at all. Um, you know, leave wringing of your hands, he says to his, his concerned mother. Oh, it was just Polonius. Come on, get over it. Um, uh, uh, peace, sit you down and let me wring your heart, he continues. And he then proceeds to do so uh, for the next, uh, for, for, you know, most of... Uh, the rest of this fairly long, uh, over 200 lines scene. Um, and of course, the, the fact that it began with the, the accidental question mark stabbing of Polonius lends drama to everything uh, that comes after, right? A lesser dramatist uh, might have made the, the stabbing of Polonius the big finish to this scene. Uh, instead, uh, Shakespeare has it happen right at the beginning. The second Hamlet enters the room, boom, stabs Polonius. So then when his, him and his mom are having this big back and forth fight, um, they're, you know, stepping, <laughs> taking turns stepping over Polonius's body uh, in the middle of this. There's a dead guy in the middle of the stage the whole time. So um, actor playing Polonius has to be, among other things, pretty good at holding his breath. Uh, and not sneezing and the like. He's got to be dead for, you know, 95% of this scene in the middle of the stage. Um, uh, of course, he's not the only guy in this scene who's dead. But more on that in a moment. Um, now, uh, this is um, Hamlet, you know, and I think to, to the distaste of more uh, liberal or, or secular humanist uh, fans of Hamlet in the modern world who, who want to claim him for, uh, you know, the, 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 the university set and the intellectuals, and he does, uh, to a great extent, work that way. Um, uh, in this scene, we get uh, the prince at his most Bible thumpy. Um, so, you know, we... we you know, as far as uh, any political tribe claiming uh, the Prince of Denmark, I, I, this scene reminds us uh, that he does not neatly fit 
um, into any modern uh, conception of being either um, quote unquote liberal or quote unquote uh, conservative. Um, he is he is beyond such uh, uh, categorizations and and dichotomies. Um, he he is uh, you know a a a very nerdy college boy. True, but um, he 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 really brings the fire and brimstone. Um, you know, straight out of the seven hundred club in this scene. Um, uh, such an act, he accuses uh, his mother of having committed, that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love, and sets a blister there, makes marriage vows as false as dicer's oaths. Such a deed is from the body of contraction, plucks the very soul, and sweet religion makes a rhapsody of words. Heaven's face doth glow o'er this solidity and compound mass with heated visage, as against the doom, is thought sick at the act. So just won't shut up about how disgusted God is uh, with his mother. Her response, I me, what act that roars so loud and thunders in the index? There is another place, by the way, where we get a... Um, uh, a, a comparison between the the, the, the world of the uh, the real world of, of the play and the fact that it is fake, that it is theater, that it is a book, right? The index can mean you know the sky, you know thundering in in the heavens, um, but of course these people are in a book. When we close that book, you know what's what's on the top of a book? The index. <laughs> so the index would be uh, heaven to people who live in a book. <laughs> Um, uh, then Hamlet uh, whips out the, uh, uh, the, the two pictures. Um, uh, look here upon uh, this picture and on this, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers, uh, his dad's picture and uh, Claudius's picture, uh, and it goes on about how, you know, how much better looking, among other things, um, his, his uh, dad was. Obviously some... Uh, emendation of, of this speech was necessary in the David Tennant Hamlet where uh, Patrick Stewart plays both uh, Claudius and Hamlet Sr. Uh, as twins. Uh, the, you know, look at their <laughs> pictures and how different they were speech wouldn't make much sense if they're twins. So they had to trim a bit of that there. Um, uh, have you eyes, he asks his mother. Uh, could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and batten on this moor? You cannot call it love, for at your age, the heyday and the blood is tame. It's humble and waits upon the judgment, and what judgment would step from this to this? In other words, you're too old to have just been, you know, swooning over how hot this guy is. So um, a backhanded compliment, if ever there was one. Um, sense, sure you have, else could you not have motion, but sure that sense is apoplexed, for madness would not err, nor sense to ecstasy was ne'er so thralled, but it reserved some quantity of choice to serve in such a difference. What devil was that thus hath cousin do at hoodman blind? Ah, okay. Um, if you want a jaw workout, read Hamlet's lines from this scene out loud as fast as you can. Um, I think uh, you know anybody who's, who's played Hamlet would agree with me there. Uh, this is the the stuff out of the many many lines he speaks that is hardest to say, and I don't mean in terms of what it means. I mean hardest on the jaw muscles. Like he's he's speaking in tongue twisters and he's mad, so he's saying it fast. Um, you know, mo most people's speech gets, you know, less complicated when we're angry. Ah, screw you, butthead! Ah, you know, just, you know, we, we speak like children when we're angry. Hamlet seems to be, as he is, you know, uh, in so many other ways, the other way around from, from most people. When he is angry, um, when, he, when he turns into a passion's slave, um, to use his own phrase from, from 3.2, uh, um, his speech gets more complex. Uh, 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 grammatically, uh, in terms of you know vocabulary and reading level, um, you know the, the the only other speech, as I mentioned in the video for for one point four, the only other speech that I think is is um, equally difficult to say quickly out loud um, uh, is is the um, 
uh, angels and ministers of grace defend us a speech from 1.4, uh, which is the first thing he says to, to his father's ghost. Um, now, uh, Gertrude is touched by all of this uh, shame, where is thy blush, um, to, 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 to some extent. Um, Hamlet, speak no more, thou turnst my eyes into my very soul, and there I see just black and grained spots as will not leave their taint. She begs him in lines uh, 88 through 91. Now, um, like Claudius in 3.1, uh, but right before Hamlet comes in to drop to be or not to be, uh, Gertrude here refers vaguely to feeling guilty about something, um, but doesn't specify exactly what it is. Thou turnst my eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and grained spots as will not leave their taint. You know, some black uh, guilt, a black spot on her soul. Now, did, does this mean she was to some degree in on the murder? Maybe not that it was her idea, but accessory after the fact. Or, or is it just about remarrying too quickly? Or maybe there was, you know, an affair when... Uh, the Hamlet Senior was alive, but she didn't know anything about any murder. She's guilty about something. We don't know what. Um, and, and we, you know, we. Th this is a place where we would really like Hamlet to shut up and let her finish. Um, you know, he, he characteristically, he cuts her off. Um, Nay, but to live in the ranks, sweat of it in semen bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. Um, Okay, most most people are not quite this into going on and on and on about their mom having sex. Um, most people don't enjoy talking about that at all, really, to, to any extent, uh, much less to the great length uh, that Hamlet does. Um, now... Uh, well, I suppose here, uh, you know, got to address it sooner or later. Not, this would be a good uh, part to talk about Sigmund Freud's famous um, identification uh, of, of Hamlet uh, with, with his theory of the Oedipus complex. Um, uh, the idea that everyone, uh, you know, or boys or heterosexual boys while, while they're developing uh, subconsciously or first consciously, and then but, but it's scared down into their subconscious you know, desire, you know, whatever that means to you in early childhood, desire the, the mother, uh, yearn to replace the, the, the father at her side. Um, and then through fear of the father, this gets externalized or sublimated into other women. Um, but you, your, your opinion of them is colored in by your opinion uh, of your own uh, mother. Uh, Sigmund Freud said that the, the, the reason uh, Hamlet cannot kill Claudius is because he sees Claudius as his own ideal self, because Claudius has done what Hamlet always subconsciously wished to do himself, i.e. Uh, kill his father and marry his mother. Um, now, uh, I think personally that, that the, the identification of, of, of Hamlet with the, this Oedipus complex theory of Sigmund Freud's is overstated. I do think that more generally Freud's idea that, you know, um, your opinion of the other gender as a whole, uh, stems from your opinion of your parent of that gender. So I'm, I'm with Freud as far as, um, you know, Hamlet is mad at all women because he's mad at his mom. That works. But as far as the Oedipus complex stuff, well, um, uh, I'll just say that I think Freud needed Shakespeare a lot more than Shakespeare needed Freud. Uh, I mean, after all, it's a, it's a pretty good advertisement for your theory. Um, a pretty good advertisement for your your pet psychological theory uh, to say that uh, it, it explains uh, the greatest thing ever written. Um, so you know th this idea that you know the Oedipus complex is the the key to Hamlet um, was was something that um, you know Sigmund Freud very much wanted to be true. A great advertisement for for his work. Um, but does this play really need it to be true? Nah. Um, 
uh, although you know some you know, is some kind of symbolic division of of uh, mother and father of male and female of body and mind in some uh, traditional uh, sexist of course uh, Aristotelian way works uh, I mean when you know Hamlet's initial back in 1.2 identification of his mother with uh, uh, animals or right? a beast that wants a discourse of reason would have mourned longer uh, and Hamlet's own obsession with people as occupying this gray area between the animals down here and God and the angels up there, um, which we hear from him in the what a piece of work is a man speech in 2-2 uh, in his uh, what should such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven uh, during the rejection of Ophelia in 3-1. Um, uh, and and we'll hear uh, uh, more from him about it uh, in the uh, how all occasions uh, speech in in four four. Um, but yes, his identification of his mother with some an animal nature. Um, sense, sure you have. Else could you not have motion? But sure that sense is apoplexed. Um, uh, uh, eyes without feeling, feeling without sight, ears without hands or eyes, smelling sans all, or but a sickly part of one true sense could not so mope, oh shame, where is thy blush? Uh, he uh, says to his mother, lines uh, 70 through 81. Um, likening Gertrude to this, again, Renaissance uh, idea of, of the beasts as automatons, you know, essentially living machines that acted according to these sort of very simplistic instincts um, uh, but did not have uh, souls or, or, or higher thought um, to any uh, extent. Um, he, so he's comparing his mother as he did very early on in, in his first scene in 1.2, comparing his mother uh, to, to the animals uh, as though she is just a, just a body, right? So he, this obsession with the mother's sex life, honeying and making love over the nasty sty, I don't think is... Uh, uh, full-on Oedipal in the way that Freud very much wanted it to be, um, but more just part and parcel of his identification with uh, 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 his identification, Hamlet's identification of his mother, the queen, with the animal kingdom. Um, you know, a, a body without a soul. And uh, just as he's in the middle of saying all this, uh, who should uh, float back into the room uh, around line uh, 102, um, but his dad, uh, who, as we already know, is a soul without a body. Um, so we have a very neat and tidy illustration of this traditional Aristotelian uh, duality, right? That, that, that the spirit is masculine and the uh, flesh is uh, feminine. Um, you know, that, that you get your, you know, you are, in, to use the Christian phrase, your father sold your mother's flesh, right? Your body is made out of your mother, but you, your soul is from your father. Um, uh, you know, this is sexist to be, yes, of course, but uh, it, it's, you know, was a going theory even in uh, the Renaissance. And we have a um, visual representation of it uh, uh, here. Um, the ghost comes in, uh, Hamlet can see him, uh, save me and hover over me with your wings, your heavenly guard. What would your gracious figure? Uh, Gertrude apparently does not, you know, alas, he's mad. Um, uh, the ghost gets his, his, his last lines. Uh, do not forget this visitation is but to wet thy almost blunted purpose, but look, amazement on thy mother sits. O oh, step between her and her fighting soul, conceit in weakest bodies, strongest works. Speak to her, Hamlet, the ghost encourages uh, his son. Uh, there's that word conceit again uh, that we saw punned on so much in Act 2, Scene 2. Um, you know, but, but to conceive in the uh, the sense of to create, you know, to conceive in the, the sexual sense, to conceive a child. Um, and here Hamlet is on, on stage between his parents, one, at least according to him, a body without a spirit, the other a spirit without a body. So uh, certainly in the Renaissance sense, conception, conceit is what's being visually, um, you know, with this sort of pietà here, 
um, and, uh, and, and conceit in the sense of concept or uh, idea. Um, now, the ghost's point here, conceit in weakest bodies, strongest works, uh, saying, you know, in weakest bodies, uh, in other words, women, um, it, it, it's easiest for an idea to, to run away with them and, and drive them uh, crazy. Um, now, this idea will be riffed on at much greater length um, in uh, Ophelia's famous mad scene. Spoilers, sorry, Act 4, Scene 5. Um, but the ghost gives us a sneak preview of, of this relationship between uh, uh, strong conceits and weak bodies here. Um, but, uh, I, I, you know, is this something Shakespeare believed? Presumably not. I mean, the, the you know, his, his more or less invention of, of uh, the strong female character in, in so many other plays um, shows demonstrates, I think, pretty conclusively that Shakespeare himself did not take this idea too seriously, um, is ironicized in this play as well, right? Claudius, the guy who's uh, calling other people unmanly for their emotions in 1.2, uh, turns out to be the guy who's committed the very unmanly act of killing with poison. Uh, if anything, the... Um, weak body that, that a strong conceit is working in, in this play, uh, is, is not, is not the queen's uh, body. It's, it's the prince's, right? It's Hamlet. Um, you know, the weak, certainly compared to his father, um, to this broadsword swinging, uh, uh, medieval badass defeating, uh, other Kings in, in single combat, uh, you know, and somehow, you know, his own son, one generation later, might as well be like, uh, you know, 400 years later. You know, the Hamlet Sr. is a, a, a medi medieval or a dark age a warrior king. His son, a, a university uh, intellectual, a philosophy nerd. You know, he's the weak body that's um, taking way longer than he said he was going to do to kill somebody. Uh, anyway, uh, the ghost encourages him to uh, speak to her, Hamlet, uh, and after that, Hamlet calms down a bit, asking, in apparent seriousness, in apparent genuine concern for his mother, uh, how is it with you, lady? Uh, her response, alas, how is it with you, with you, that you do bend your eye on vacancy and with the incorporeal air do hold discourse, uh, makes clear to the audience, in case we didn't know already, that Gertrude cannot see the ghost. So um, uh, we might pause here to ask, okay, um, this is the first time in the play that the ghost has been on stage and uh, another character who is also on stage cannot see him. Uh, you know, a, a lot of, of uh, time and, and, and energy was spent in act one establishing that the ghost was real, right? Um, other characters besides Hamlet see the ghost. The very first scene of the play, um, three guys, uh, um, uh, Marcellus, Bernardo, and Horatio, all see the ghost and agree with each other about what they saw. Um, when, when Hamlet first sees his dad's ghost in, in 1-4, uh, the, the, those, those guys uh, are around uh, again and can also see him. Um, in the very end, uh, um, in the, the closing pages of, of 1.5, um, th they even uh, hear the ghost uh, uh, speak. The, it, it's ambiguous, I suppose, but the swear, swear, swear by his sword that the ghost is bellowing beneath the stage, it's usually played as though the other guys can also hear that, uh, not just Hamlet. Um, so, so, you know, you, other characters, at least with those few words, the swear, 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 besides Hamlet, hear the ghost speak as well. Um, so it's established in several places in Act 1 that this isn't like, you know, Caesar's ghost or Banquo's ghost that, you know, the guy is probably imagining. Uh, you know, this ghost is real. And here we have, like with, you know, Banquo's ghost at the, the feast in, in Macbeth, uh, the, the, the standard Shakespeare trick of, one guy can see the ghost and somebody else can't. Um, so what would be the possible explanations here? Um, 
Does her inability to see the ghost imply something about Gertrude's guilt, right? It may be some these black and grained spots uh, on her soul have something to do with why she can't see the ghost. Um, you know, does, does it mean she was in on the murder? But then again, you know, a couple of soldiers see the ghost in 1.1 and, and 1.4. They've presumably killed people in war. Uh, well, you kill people in war, it's different. Is it? The Bible doesn't say so. It just says don't kill. Well, everybody says it's different if you do it in war. Yeah, how do we know those people are right? Anyway, um, so possibly something to do with her guilt. Um, you know, uh, another uh, uh, possibility is that the ghost can control who sees him and who doesn't, um, and that he's just choosing to be made manifest to his son, but not to his uh, former wife uh, in this scene. If that's the case, curious decision on the ghost's part. I mean, if I were him, uh, she would have been the first person I appear. Hey, you know, that guy you're married to now, he killed me. Um, you know, I, I don't know why, if, if it's up to the ghost, he would, he would choose for his, his um, queen not to see him. Uh Unless, unless we, we think it's to do with this whole uh, amazement sitting on her and uh, strong conceits working in her weak body, he fears that it would drive her mad because she's only a woman and her uh, poor female brain couldn't handle it. Um, uh, now, uh, the other, speaking of gender, possibility uh, here is that maybe women can't see the ghost, right? All of the characters who do see the ghost are men. Uh, this is the only time that the ghost is on stage when a woman is and she can't see him. Um, if there was some kind of Renaissance, medieval, Catholic, Protestant, Gnostic, whatever um, uh, uh, idea that like women couldn't see ghosts, uh, I've yet to come across it. If anyone knows of anybody who ever argued something like this, uh, back in the day, uh, by all means, let me know about it in, in the comments so I can go check it out. Um, uh, if that is the case, I don't know why it would be, unless it's just another way of backing up this, you know, uh, Aristotelian women equal body, men equal spirit thing. Um, now, uh, uh, some people have suggested uh, a fourth possibility, which is that um, Gertrude actually can see the ghost and she's pretending she can't. <sighs> um, I don't think so. But then again, I never want to underestimate this play's capacity to surprise me uh, uh, 10 years from now uh, or tomorrow. I might decide that that's definitely the explanation, right? For, for some reason that, that hasn't occurred to me yet. Um, you know, other people who are obsessed with, with this play uh, uh, and know what I mean when I say that it's, it's, you know, no matter how many times you read it, new thing, you, you find new things every time. Um, and, you know, there's stuff you might've thought uh, was, was unimportant or could be cut or, uh, you know, years later, you'll, you'll, it'll suddenly occur to you that that's actually the key to the whole play. So this idea that uh, Gertrude can see the ghost, but is pretending she can't, uh, you know, it uh, doesn't seem plausible to me. I admit I can't disprove it. Now, I will say, if that's what she's doing, she would have to be the greatest actress of all time. Uh, you know, your, your dead husband's ghost suddenly appears in a room and without missing a beat, you're just like, what? I don't see anything. Um, uh, you know, th that, that would take skill. But then again, uh, this, the play is about acting. Um, uh, and, and, you know, um, the, this phrase about uh, uh, Hecuba of Troy from 2.2, the Moblet queen, the masked queen, right? Gertrude is um, the character who never lets her, her mask slip. So... You know, what do I know? Maybe that is it. Uh, in any case, she does a good job of, of 
acting like she thinks her son is crazy and speaking to, to thin air. Uh, this is the very coinage of your brain, she tells him in line 137. Uh, this bodiless creation, ecstasy is very, very cunning in. Hamlet is offended by this. Ecstasy, my pulse as yours doth temperately keep time and makes as healthful music. It is not madness that I have uttered, bring me to the test, and either matter will reword which madness would gamble from. Um, in other words, you know, hey, I'm definitely not crazy. You know, ask me to say all the same stuff again in, in paraphrase, and I'll be able to do it. That's proof I'm not crazy. A madman couldn't do that. Uh, take my pulse. It's it's you know the, the going to the same beat as yours. Um, uh, mother, for love of grace, lay not that flattering unction to your soul that not your trespass, but my madness speaks. Uh, in other words, don't flatter yourself. Um, by, by thinking that the deal here is just that I'm crazy rather than that you've done something uh, terribly uh, sinful to, to thunder in the index and, and piss off God. Now, uh, here we might be wondering if Hamlet was going to put all of this energy into this plan of pretending to be crazy, um, why keep <laughs> getting offended whenever anyone thinks he is crazy and begging them to believe that he isn't. Um, it seems to, you know, get in the way of the, the, the pretending to be crazy plan here. Um, uh, he, he begs her to stop sleeping uh, with uh, Claudius. Good night, but go not to my uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. Um and uh, he, he gets in, in the, the last page and a half or so uh, to the unpleasant, or at least to us it would be unpleasant, doesn't seem to bother him too much, uh, business of dragging Polonius's body from the room. Uh, For this same Lord I do repent, uh, he says around line 172. Uh, but heaven hath pleased it so to punish me with this and this with me that I must be their scourge and minister. Um, Whoa, so he's now, now he was doing God's work by killing Polonius? Um, he's so sure that, that God hated Polonius that he was, you know, a, a, you know, God, God killed Polonius. I was only the, the instrument. Um, okay. Uh, and a good culminating in his, his famous line, I must be cruel only to be kind. Questionable, but, uh, you know, he, he appears to think he is actually doing... Uh, his mother good, doing good for his mother's uh, immortal soul by um, screaming at her until she agrees to stop having sex with her husband. Um, uh, and, and, and gosh, look at this. Um, when she asks him, you know, what shall I do? Uh, and she seems, after all this, to, to, to trust him. There does seem, after the ghost swoops in and leaves, to be a kind of under rapprochement, understanding, whatever we want to call it, between uh, uh, the prince and his mother. I think it is um, just such verisimilitude here as far as capturing uh, what a, a, the kind of fight you can only have with family is like, where it goes from, from just murderous screaming to sort of crying and, and not even apologies, but unspoken apologies, um, you know, on a dime. And if something is suddenly understood that nobody uh, uh, spoke aloud, um, you know, especially between a, a mother and a son, uh, D.H. Lawrence, a few hundred years later, is also very good at uh, that sort of thing. But as with everything else, uh, Shakespeare did it first and better. And this scene's a great example. What shall I do? The queen asks her son at line 180. Uh, not this by no means that I bid you do. Let the bloat king tempt you again to bed, uh, etc., and make you to ravel all this matter out that I essentially am not in madness, but mad in craft. In other words, don't tell the king uh, that I'm uh, only pretending to be crazy and that I'm not really crazy. Now, that seems to be a, a uh, great and very sudden degree of trust 
that Hamlet suddenly has for his mother, for, for the most pernicious woman of uh, 1.5, who was even worse than the villain, villain, smiling, damned villain. Um, suddenly he trusts her not to tell the king that he's only pretending to be crazy. I mean, he trusted his mom less than anybody. He, he was madder at his mom than anyone. Um, again, what is the point of this whole pretending to be crazy thing if he just immediately tells everyone that he's you know, for whose benefit he's supposedly faking it, that it's just an act? Telling Rosencrantz and Guildenstern back in uh, 2.2 that uh, uh, my uncle, father, and aunt mother are deceived. I am but mad north, northwest when the wind is southerly. I know a hawk from a handsaw. Hey, you know, hey, don't tell the king and Quinn, but uh, I'm not really crazy. I'm just faking it. He knows that they're there to spy on him for the king and queen. And now he tells the queen, hey, guess what? I'm not really crazy. I'm faking it. Um, does he suddenly trust his mom, uh, trust that she's on, on his side somehow? Or does he just, you know, not really care and maybe never really cared about the whole pretending to be crazy thing? Um you know, we, we saw with the, the heckling of his own play in, in uh, uh, 3.2 that Hamlet does have a, a proclivity for um, you know, uh, throwing uh, spanners into the works of his own plans. Um, uh, I must to England, you know that, he reminds his mother. There's letters sealed on my two schoolfellows, whom I will trust as I will, adders fanged, they bear the mandate, they must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. Uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are, are uh, escorting me to England, but, uh, you know, he, the way he's talking about them suddenly, very uh, judgmental, merciless. Tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard, and it shall go hard, but I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. Um, you know, they, they're laying explosives for me, but I'll make sure, in other words, that they get uh, uh, exploded on their own explosives. Um, so uh, what, what we are, um, the impression of Hamlet that we're left with as this, this as this scene and, and as act three itself draws to a close here is this sudden mercilessness, um, uh, not caring uh, that he that he killed Polonius? Right? I'll lug the guts into the neighbor room. He says, uh, "This counselor is now most still, most secret, and most grave. Who was in life a foolish prating knave? Come, sir, to draw towards an end with you." He says, making fun of Polonius's dead body as he drags him from the room with the final good night mother, um, completely unbothered by the fact that he's killed Polonius and, and foreshadowing that he um, should uh, the occasion demand it, um, uh, wouldn't be too bothered by uh, having something similar in store for Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Um, it's as though the, the taste of blood uh, that Hamlet got at the beginning of this scene, even though it was the wrong guy's blood. Um, it, it, it's getting a little, he likes it, you know, more, more than he uh, uh, anticipated that he would, more than this, uh, you know, meek and melancholy uh, uh, theology and philosophy student. Uh, uh, thought that he would. So um, from this point forward uh, to act four and five, it's, um, you know, watch out for that Hamlet guy, I guess, from, from here on out.